Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Marr. I'm with Risk Management Professionals, and I uh, appreciate your joining us for our webinar this morning that's going to look at the uh, SEMS program and the current developments with uh, the evolution into SEMS II, dealing with contractors, and also independent third-party audits. Uh, we're going to frame the entire presentation around a uh, looking at a little bit of history, the overall shift towards safety management systems. And, um, but before we get into that, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about logistics. Uh, what we're uh, doing is using a WebEx framework for the presentation that does, is something we use a lot as, our, as part of our engineering consulting activities. When we work with clients, when we do HAZOP studies, we actually do quite a few remotely now, um, and basically um, uh, interact with other offices, et cetera. So uh, what we do is we use that as a framework for broadcasting, and then basically all the participants are logging in. But we do put you on mute during the course of the presentation. So if you're having a conversation, working uh, with somebody else in your office, uh, answering the phone, uh, or other things that won't, that won't distract the other participants for the webinar. Um, the, there's a couple of uh, technical items that you want to be sensitive to. But if you do have problems, please feel free to call the office here. It's 877-532-0806. That's 877-532-0806. And the number is on the back of the presentation materials that were sent to you last night also. If you're having a technical problem, just call. Somebody will, will work with you to try to resolve that. And uh, if you're uh, active and want to chat with our producer, Solvay Sather, you can use the chat window to send a message to RMPCORP. And then she'll uh, respond to the message, help you out. Or if you have a question to pose later in the presentation, uh, she'll go ahead and take that question and make sure the speakers address that. Um, uh, are you talking about the pull down from the top? All right. Uh, for a lot of the different features for what you're doing, there's a pull down from the top. If you use your mouse to hover near the top of your screen, you'll see there's a pull down menu that comes down. And you can access the chat window as well as some other features for your computer setup. Uh, all the the uh, main body of the presentation will have a video of the speaker and a uh, an image of the slides. Feel free to resize the windows with your mouse uh, as you see fit. Um, okay, so that's basically how how we're going to get things done. So let me go ahead and uh, and tell you a little bit more about our topics. Again, we're going to focus on the SEMS program, offshore facilities. But as you'll see, a lot of what we're going to talk about also applies to onshore facilities, too. And we're going to frame, frame it as a paradigm shift that's uh, really representing a cultural change in terms of how we address safety. Um, I'll also introduce our other speaker, Ian Sutton, what, uh, after we transfer control to him for his portion of the presentation. Uh, the key topics that we're going to be uh, uh, discussing uh, are driving forces, how these offshore facility uh, safety management systems regulations have evolved, a uh, little bit about uh, different risks and how they interface with regulations, parallels between onshore and offshore safety management systems, and also comparison of the safety environmental management system that requirements that are coming out of BSE for offshore facilities to other safety management systems programs. Uh, we'll also be talking about SEMS II contractors and independent third-party audits and how to organize the SEMS program so it's most effective for you and you can pull it together as easily as possible. So first, what I'd like to talk about are the driving forces, uh, why we're discussing this, why we are where we are right now. <coughs> um, or the, the thing that catalyzed a lot of recent developments in the regulatory framework for offshore facilities is the Deepwater Horizon accident uh, in April of 2010. Uh, there were some uh, unfortunate fatalities, many injuries, and a lot of oil released into the Gulf of Mexico that made the headlines, that really brought, brought up a lot of attention to offshore facility safety practices, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, evolving from that uh, in October of 2010 is 30 CFR Part 250, which is the Safety and Environmental Management Systems rule that came out. Uh, in response, that's a regulatory response directly attributable to the accident. However, years before that, there were some draft regulations for SEMS. And even before that, industry had put forth a SEMP program, and a number of state agencies also had some programs going. So a lot of these things are kind of coming together and coalescing as part of the SEMS program. Uh, with the October 2010 promulgation, 
was an effective date of November 2011 for SEMS implementation. And at that point, uh, Bessie had the authorization to enforce as they, see, as they saw fit uh, for people who weren't complying with the SEMS requirements. Now, there's also some, some um, potential deficiencies were identified uh, by industry and other people, other stakeholders. And uh, SEMS 2, an, an update to that, an amended version of SEMS is due for publication this upcoming quarter in the latter part of 2012. And um, what the enforcement uh, deadlines for that or when the effective dates for that are currently unknown and undefined. And I'll let Ian Sutton talk a little bit more about that. The one thing that everybody should keep in mind is that there, the timing for the auditing portion of the, your SEMS program, given the effective date of November 15, 2011, November, these are on a, the initial audit was to be done two years after your initial SEMS program completion, which could have been before November 15, 2011, but the audits needed to be done on a two, uh, the, the first audit would be two years after that, and then a three-year cycle thereafter. So the first audit uh, should be done within two years of your SEMS completion, which the latest date for that should have been November 15, 2011. So November 15, 2013 is a big date for a lot of folks to have completed their initial SEMS audit of their SEMS program. So that's a little bit of the timeline in terms of what, what some recent events, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about history shortly. But before we get into that, I'd like to focus a little bit about um, contrasting some, some key issues out there associated with uh, personal safety and process safety and different types of regulatory approaches to that. And so I want to frame that so we're real clear on performance-based regulations and how it fits into the big picture of, of things. Um, when we're looking at various safety issues, if you're looking at simple things like uh, tripping over wire, the, the direct causal events are a little bit easy to, to visualize. But when you're looking at major incidents, they're rarely caused by a single catastrophic failure, but usually by multiple things that are coinciding at just the wrong time. And a lot of people represent that as a Swiss cheese model, a spinning disc model, both of which you've seen. But the idea is you've got a lot of intangibles that may be occurring at the same time, and together they, they are just it's the perfect storm of, the, of things happening at the wrong time that can lead to a catastrophe. When you look at most major events that have occurred historically, that's, that's what's happened. That tends to highlight those con or contrast personal safety versus process safety. When you're looking at personal safety issues, such as tripping over a wire, you may look at lost time injuries. The key controls of that are maybe personal protective equipment or attentiveness to your job activities. And you can have pretty, pretty direct mechanisms that can be prescriptive with respect to uh, actual, um, actually regulating them. Process safety is a totally different animal. And we'll talk about indicators in a couple minutes. But process safety, we're looking at potential larger consequences, injuries, financial impact, potentially major environmental impacts. And the key mechanisms for control, when you look at things historically and also logically, are through management systems. And in this particular case, safety management systems. So regulatory mechanisms that work best here are performance-based. Because it's, there's so many intangibles, uh, having a direct requirement for each and every action, each and every piece of equipment isn't practical, especially since when you're looking at multiple things happening at once, every facility, every situation, every organization is unique. For that reason, performance-based regulations are typically considered more suitable for that. When you look at personal safety versus process safety, sure, there's a lot of overlap. And, and there is a lot, there's a lot to be said for uh, having a good sa safety program to address personal safety issues. But when you're looking at the correlation between are you doing a good job on personal safety issues versus process safety, it's like looking at um, the potential for a major airline accident but based on uh, slips, trips, and falls from the baggage handlers. You can't really correlate those very well. There's a limited correlation. And in the same way, correlating slips, trips, and falls to an offshore facility to potential major accidents, yeah, there's some overlap, but it's a limited correlation. You can't just hang your hat on, oh, gee, we've got, a, we've got um, fewer lost time injuries, people, people haven't had uh, injuries to their hand or whatever. 
can't really hang your hat on that. And recently, if, if you need some more information, uh, www.csb.gov, there's some results from a recent hearing on safety performance indicators that was done in Houston. And uh, basically, as part of that, what came out is that there's a, a real important need for uh, performance indicators that are more focused on process safety and a lot of uh, the personal safety indicators that people have classically used really don't apply as well as you'd like them to and the, hence the importance of that. When you're looking at the regulatory framework, uh, you've got prescriptive regulations, as I mentioned, focused that, that do a good job focusing on personal safety, but goal or performance-based regulations, such as safety management systems, a la uh, safety cases, SEMS, a PSM, RMP, and I'll get, I'll, if, those, if you're not familiar with the acronyms, I'll get to those in a few minutes. But it's really the performance-based regulations that can better address some of these more catastrophic events. So now that we've characterized personal safety versus process safety and prescriptive regulations and, and performance-based regulations and why they need to be, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the parallels of what's out there in terms of safety management systems. When you look at historically uh, what has occurred um, uh, there, uh, in terms of major accidents, Bhopal India sticks in a lot of folks' minds with respect to offshore, onshore facility events, some procedural errors, uh, shutting off key safety systems, uh, some, some lack of control on management of change activities resulted in a significant release of methyl isocyanate, uh, a lot of lives lost, a lot of very uh, painful uh, and significant injuries, uh, disability, uh, disabling injuries to, to people that resulted from that. Um, that was a key precursor that woke folks up to the need for the application of safety management systems for onshore facilities. For offshore facilities, uh, Piper Alpha, the accident that occurred that resulted in 167 lives lost, uh, was a, a bellwether event for waking people up to the need for the application and control of these key performance-based issues on offshore facilities. Uh, some key uh, underlying causes were uh, problems with the work permit system, uh, maintenance issues that weren't controlled properly, lining practices, uh, and various operational controls, all these things that led to a significant loss of life and significant damage. Those two events were key catalyzing events for onshore and offshore that, that caused a response. Uh, when you're looking at those events themselves, obviously there's a lot of business interruption, lost confidence, lives lost. In all cases, it wasn't like you're looking at brand new technology that pushes the limits of science. It was really managing the technologies and the way you're using the technologies that are already out there. When you look at the, the precursors, they're relatively simple. The initiating events after the, after the event were pretty easy to understand. So the root causes were really failure to main design, maintain design intent and really manage the technology and manage how you operate the technology. So if you're fixing that, or trying to make things better, you're really looking at safety culture and management systems as a key mechanism for addressing those kind of issues. When you look at historically, um, it's really interesting to look at timelines and how industry and agencies have responded to key events that have catalyzed our drive towards performance-based regulations. If you're looking at onshore uh, facility process safety, Obviously, the um, uh, methyl isocyanate release in the Bhopal 1984 accident catalyzed that. One of the initial responses was uh, through, uh, from industry with the formation of the Center for Chemical Process Safety in the mid-'80s. I believe it was uh, in, shortly after the December event in 1984, but in early, early and mid-1985 that the CCPS was formed. And I actually had the honor of serving on the Technical Steering Committee in the mid-'80s. And uh, one of the first things that was done was the formulation of a technical management guide. Very first thing was an industry response, and the very first thing was providing a guide for management systems elements. This was the year 1987. Time goes on. Uh, the API, American Petroleum Institute, recognizes a need for adopting management systems approaches for its facilities. Uh, recommended practice 750 came out in 1990. And for onshore facilities, uh, the regulators also were doing work in parallel. When you look at some of the state programs for, for uh, the onshore facilities, 
risk management prevention programs was evolving in the late 80s out of California. And in 1992, on the United States federal level, process safety management was promulgated. Uh, following that, shortly after that, in 1996, risk management programs were promulgated by the EPA. Uh, when you're looking at offshore safety management systems events in the United States, uh, after that, industry, after the Piper Alpha event, in industry took a lot of initiative. In 1990, I actually uh, had the uh, privilege of, of spearheading a project for uh, platform safety shutdown system evaluations and actually doing a, a quantitative assessment of different types of protection systems. At that time, they were evolving from analog to digital to voting logic and all sorts of different choices that were, people were making in, in the, under the goal of making sure that offshore facilities were safe. So industry was, the individual companies were jumping on top of that. Uh, and, and also industry came up with SEMP or safety and environmental management programs in 1991 and actually API promulgated our recommended practice 75 to put forth the SEMP concept formally. And that's really what a lot of offshore facilities worked with for a long time. Later on, uh, recommended practice 75 was updated in 2004. Uh, the SEMS concept was put forth in the Federal Register in 2006, and a proposed rule was put forth in 2009. But there wasn't a lot of driving force, and, and we'll talk about why in a couple of seconds, until the, the Deepwater Horizon event and the final rule for SEMS that came out in 2010. Um, also, for the uh, offshore safety management systems in the United States, various state programs evolved. And, and also in California, the State Lands Commission had a very active program for application of SIMP and auditing the application of SIMP at the offshore facilities in their jurisdiction. When you're looking internationally, because Piper Alpha was not in the United States, you really saw a lot of the initiative at the federal in the, in the United States for offshore facilities from industry. And it really was for, not, didn't really come about for the federal level until much, much later. However, because it was in UK waters, uh, the United Kingdom put forth safety gate case rules in 1992, updated in 2005, and it's continued to evolve. And a key part of the safety case is, although people tend to focus on a lot of the calculations and analyses that are done, a key part of that is formulation of a solid safety management system program. So when you look at all these different uh, events uh, in the United States, outside the United States, a lot of it is, uh, tends to focus on the, uh, uh, where, where it is geographically in terms of where the initiatives are being taken and whether it's onshore or offshore that people tend to relate to and realize that, gosh, that can happen here, so I better do something. The interesting thing is that from the initial technical management guidelines published in 1987 by the CCPS, when you look at those core elements of how to manage a safety program, there's more similarities than differences for those initial safety management system concepts in 1987 when you look at all the things that are happening right now with process safety management, risk management programs, and SEMS. Again, a lot more similarity than differences. So a lot of the concepts and, and the effectiveness of those concepts really haven't changed. Uh, also, I'd like to distinguish um, two types of things. I mentioned safety environmental management systems and also safety cases. Safety cases includes safety management systems as well as risk assessment and quantification. So it is more complicated. So there's a range of different regulations, a range of different approaches. Um, we're going to focus on SIMS because that's what a lot of people are working towards improving their application at their facility. So what I'd like to do is compare SIMS, Safety Environmental Management Systems, for offshore facilities to other safety management system programs. When you look at the key SIMS elements, um, general provisions, safety environmental information, hazards analysis, management change, et cetera, when you're, you're looking at those, again, those are a lot of key elements that overlap things that are done, uh, done on other safety management system programs. I've illustrated those in a little pinwheel here. The, key, the one, items in red are things that uh, existed in terms of the initial SEMS proposed rule in 2006 and were also key elements in terms of SEMP. Those same key elements, hazards analysis, management change, operating procedures, and mechanical integrity can also be, so the more uh, 
difficult items to implement and are some of the items that are most often cited by the different regulatory agencies because these things are difficult to keep up with, because changes are always occurring and you need to manage them and you need to document how you're doing it and properly evaluate safety. Hazards analysis, you need to evaluate potential hazards. Operating procedures, they can change all the time and there's a need for periodic update. And also a mechanical integrity program, keeping up with preventive maintenance, testing, and all the different elements that make sure that the design intent for, that, uh, for the operation of that equipment occur. So those red circles are things that people get cited for the most for uh, onshore facilities, and they're things that were a core part of the initial SIMS proposed rule in 2006. All these circles are things that are currently part of the SIMS program, with the exception of a couple of items. The items, uh, one of the items in red, hazards analysis, is also evolving as part of SIMS 2. Uh, I'll let Ian Sutton talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the auditing also morphing and changing quite a bit for SIMS 2. And employee participation is going to be a new element uh, to frame the interaction between contractors, oper uh, op the operating company, and other stakeholders uh, that, that are in charge of safety at an offshore facility. And uh, so those items in orange are things that are changing or, or coming about as part of SEMS 2. Um, this slide is pretty straightforward. The, the big green area are the items that overlap. You'll recognize the acronyms from the previous slide. Key things like safety and environmental information, hazards analysis, uh, emergency response and control, management change, all those things are core parts of all safety management systems. So when you're looking at SEMS, whether you're looking at process safety management, whether you're looking at risk management programs, there's more in common than not. And we'll talk to you a little bit later on how you can use that to your advantage. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go through this. This is just a handy compliance matrix. If you're looking at the uh, sections on the left, those are the key topical areas for safety and environmental management systems. And the specific citation in uh, 30 CFR Part 250 is right there. So what I'd like to do is talk about those key differences a little bit more before I turn it over to Ian to talk about some of these uh, new developments with the program. Uh, when you're looking at safety and environmental information, um, uh, process safety, inf uh, th that's the SEMS term, or process safety information, which is the process safety management term, the differences, the concepts, the things that you need to gather, the core elements, uh, good engineering drawings, uh, good, good uh, operational limits on equipment, all those things are very common, whether you're dealing with an offshore facility or onshore facility. So the real differences for what you have to do are very minimal. Hazards analysis is treated quite a bit different in SEMS. If you're looking at SEMS, you've got to update the hazards analysis on three-year intervals starting on the second year. A little confusing, but if you did your hazards analysis in, you know, on November 1st, 2011, then what, what you'd want to do is update that hazards analysis on November 1st, 2013, and after that, November 1st, 2016, and every three years after that. What they've done, which is good with SEMS, and I do like this, is they've synchronized that update for the hazards analysis with the timing intervals for the, uh, the, for the audits, those compliance audits. Uh, that'll make it a little easier for you guys to track and actually get things done. Uh, those timing intervals are quite a bit different for process safety management and risk management programs that require revalidation every five years for hazards analysis, but are also on that three-year cycle for compliance audits. A little confusing, and a lot of people tend to get in trouble that way. Uh, another key difference for hazards analysis for SEMS is a requirement for supplemental job safety analysis. Um, why is that highlighted for SEMS? Well, a lot of activities on offshore facilities are more batch-oriented, more hands-on. The environment's changing a lot more frequently. A job safety analysis is a good way to encapsulate those things that are being done physically uh, by personnel at the plant site. I'm sorry, on the offshore facility. Um, SEMS 2, there's going to be additional JSA requirements. I'll let Ian talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, management of change, the concept is the same. The requirements are basically the same. So differences, if, you've got a, if you're a part of a company that has already has a management of change program for your onshore facilities, you can start with that. Minimal changes for use for SEMS. Operating procedures, a, little, a few differences with respect to control. There's a, there's a few more specific items for offshore facilities. And also, the review periods are more left up to the facility itself. 
Uh, you've got to make sure emergency operations are involved, are identified. Procedures must include the job title and reporting relationship. And also, you've got to have operating modes associated with bypassing out of service equipment specifically stated in your operating procedures. Uh, you must also include a uh, look at impacts on people and also the marine environment and make sure your hazards analysis is synchronized with the operating procedures in that respect. And also, it specifically calls out that changes must be communicated to potentially affected personnel. It's really part of anybody's good safety management system program with respect to operating procedures. However, it's specifically called out for SEMS. Uh, one of the things that's a little different for PSM and RMP are, is a specific call for annual recertification. Uh, when you're looking at safe work practices, again, another SEMS element, differences between the SEMS requirement and other PSM and RMP requirements are relatively minor. Uh, there are some things that Ian's going to bring out with respect to SEMS 2 changes. Training. Uh, SEMS doesn't specify a training frequency, but it does say that they should work on drills. Again, a lot of these things are reflective of different environments. When you're looking at emergency events that can occur at an offshore facility, you have fewer options for personnel evacuation and safety than you do for an onshore facility typically. So a lot of those differences in location, logistics, uh, the, the environment for offshore facilities are reflected in SEMS, even though a lot of these core management system elements are the same. Okay, you're also referencing API recommended practices for initial training. Uh, you need to document specifically instructor qualifications that was left uh, quite loose for PSM and RMP. And also, you've got to um, uh, communicate and address changes to affected personnel. Uh, PSM and RMP, there is a specific requirement for training every three years. That's not so much a requirement for SEMS. Uh, mechanical integrity, the concept is this: every facility is different. Every uh, gr uh, group of equipment is different. So everybody's program is unique in that respect. However, the concepts and general requirements between PSM, RMP, and SEMS are, are pretty much the same. Pre-startup re review requirements, minimal differences. Emergency response and control, again, very different environment for an offshore facility. You have to have an emergency ac action plan, uh, assignment of a designated emergency control center, and also you've got conduct tra training and drills. Recognizing that for an offshore facility event, you're, a lot of your resources aren't necessarily going to be there, right there, and there's got to be a much better interaction between facility personnel, the operating company, and contractors involved, and eight emergency response agencies that are there to potentially help out. Um, for PSM and RMP, they do specify a specific annual update as part of best practices, even there's, there's, there's not a specific timing requirement for SEMS. Okay, incident investigation. Uh, for SEMS, so they, don't, they don't have a specific timeline, whereas for PSM and RMP, you have to start it within 48 hours. SEMS doesn't necessarily require that, but they do want their findings utilized and reviewed during the next analysis update. Practice anyhow for anybody with an onshore facility, and you've got to correlate the investigation findings and corrective actions to specific causes. I do get occasionally for incident investigations, and it's really easy to find direct causes. It's really easy to find things that, that are right in front of you or directly contributed to the event, but really digging down, what were the root problems? Are they management systems oriented? Are they training oriented? Is there a fundamental flaw in the mechanical integrity program? All these things are things that you want to look at as part of your incident investigation. Uh, auditing. Auditing is uh, going to be quite a bit different, uh, especially if uh, SEMS 2 is uh, enacted as it's currently stated. Uh, auditing for these different SEMS elements for offshore facilities was always quite a bit different. Uh, it did have a little bit different intervals. The, the second year after the initial SEMS program completion was for the first audit. That's that November 15, 2013 date that I mentioned. Uh, and yes, we're, we're going to be involved as engineering contractors that do SEMS work. for helping out a lot of folks on that. Um, there's a requirement to submit audit plans beforehand and reports afterwards to uh, the, the regulatory body. And obviously, I didn't update this for a while, too. It's certainly, certainly Bessie now, not Bomer. And um, 
You've got also an a requirement for independent program review, and uh, Ian's going to talk a lot more about additional details on training and requirements for independent third-party auditors or the, the, a lot, what a lot of people are dreading, the I3 piece. Um, other key difference, okay, so for process safety management, risk management programs, also in a three-year period, and there's a requirement to retain the two most recent audits, but the independence, the, as prescriptive in terms of how to do the audit and issuing the audit reports isn't a requirement for PSM and RMP. Uh, records and documentation, um, SEMS program, SEMS documentation, and we'll talk more about how to do this, needs to be in a couple places. You need key things on the facility, but a lot of your support and a lot of activities are done at onshore, with onshore support groups. So those things need to be, uh, a copy of the SEMS program for easy accessibility and updating also needs to be kept in an onshore location, and it needs to be kept for six years uh, for the most part. For two years, though, you need to keep JSA records, MOC documentation, injury and illness logs, and also contractor safety policy and procedure evaluations. Um, they will probably be, the, the audit results are probably going to get looked at pretty frequently, as well as other documentation. So in general, Bessie wants records to be kept orderly, readily identifiable, retrievable, so that it facilitates their ability to monitor and regulate the program. Um, and also for PSM and RMP, in addition to each of the individual elements, supporting documentation must be kept for five years. When you're looking at some of the newer things that are coming out with respect to SEMS, employee participation uh, is going to be a minimal difference in terms of how people go about ensuring the participation of the stakeholders and individuals involved in the facility uh, if you're look, comparing onshore and offshore. When you're looking at contractor safety, there's quite a few differences from onshore to offshore facilities. Offshore facilities tend to use uh, contractors quite a bit, and the, that um, line that you draw between the responsibilities of the operating company and the responsibilities of the contractors are things that are currently in play, and uh, Bessie is trying to do some, do some things to better manage that. So there will be quite a few differences between how onshore facilities are handled with respect to contractor safety and offshore facilities. Uh, what I've done on the next page is I've provided a quick summary of a handy table in terms of some of the key difference areas between safety and environmental management systems for offshore facilities and PSM and RMP for onshore facilities. Um, this is for reference. Uh, the key thing is that there's more in common than not. When you've got a solid safety management system program, even if you go back to a lot of the key elements in the 1987 CCPS guidance document, there's more similarities and differences, whether you're talking about these different onshore versus offshore programs, whether you're talking about international versus domestic, there's more in common than not. We do a lot of work as engineering consultants with PSM, RMP, and SEMS, and when, when you're looking at onshore versus offshore, international versus domestic, um, a lot of the things that work are, can, be, can be brought forth in all those different areas. Okay, I think at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, transfer it over to Ian. He's going to spend a little bit more time on SEMS 2 uh, contractors and also the uh, independent third-party audits. But let me go ahead and introduce Ian properly first. Uh, Ian is a chemical engineer who, speci who specializes in process risk management and process safety management in the refining uh, chemical and offshore oil and gas industries. Uh, he is based in Virginia, very widely published. I'd have a hard time believing that anybody who's not listening on this webinar hasn't seen some of Ian's uh, blogs, his uh, knolls, his publications, many of the books that he's written, and a lot of these focus on things that are going on in the offshore industry versus on onshore facilities too. Uh, Education-wise, he's a chemical engineer from Nottingham University, and he has a master's in literature uh, from the University of Houston. So anyhow, let me transfer it over to Ian, and he's going to bring us up to date on some of the things that are currently in play and uh, exist as proposed rules. Okay, well, good morning. My name is Ian Sutton. Um, I've worked with uh, Steve and his management professionals for many years. Um, and he's asked me to talk about three things, SEMS 2, independent third-party auditors, 
and something that came out just about two weeks ago or three weeks ago that has caught us all by surprise is the concept that inks, incidents of non-compliances, can be applied to contractors as well as to um, operators. A couple of um, logistical things. I understand that this presentation will be available for download um, from either my website or from um, the Risk Management Professional website in two or three days. If you want to keep up to date on SEMS, we have a, a very active LinkedIn site. And if you go to LinkedIn and then sort of type in SEMS, you'll find it. Uh, membership is increasing rapidly and we're getting some very good discussions. Um, and then finally, I probably should point out that the SEMS2 phrase is an informal phrase. And I think partly I, I'm the one who's given it some traction. That everything we say about SEMS2 is provisional. Um, the standard was published in November of last year for public comment. So the comments are in, and there were a lot of them. They have not told us when SEMS2 will become uh, effective, but I have talked to Bessie Senior Management, and it's probably October of this year, which is just one month away. But even then, there'll probably be a delay, a gap between the date of publication and the date that, um, that it becomes effective. My guess, and it is a guess, is that they will wait until the first wave of audits are completed, which will be um, in the fall of next year, 2013. So my, my hunch is that SEMS2 will kick in sometime toward the end of next year. The timeline that Steve has already alluded to, very simple. The SEMP standard from API RP75 came in in 1991 uh, in response basically to Piper Alpha. It was the American response as distinct from the British response, which was one of safety cases. Uh, the first mention of the SEMS rule was in 2006. And the MMS, as it was then, adopted just four elements. SEMP and process safety management are very similar. Uh, and then, of course, came Deepwater Horizon that changed everything. And they published the SEMS rule in 2010, and they included all 12 elements from SEMP. So basically, they made process safety no longer a recommended practice. They made it the law. And November 15th, 2011, which is well, eight, nine months ago, was the effective date. Um, I put 2012 there for SEMS2, but that is an estimate. I may be wrong on that. Comparison to PSM, Steve's already alluded to this, that SEMP and SEMS are very similar to process safety management. The big difference probably is that SEMP and SEMS did not have an employee participation element. Um, which, of course, PSM does. And that is probably the key thing about SEMS2, the whole concept of employee participation in various forms. That's probably the big change from SEMS to SEMS2. Otherwise, most of the elements are very similar. There's no issue about trade secrets offshore, but otherwise the differences are, are very minor. The official title then of SEMS2 is Oil and Gas Sulfur Operations on the Outer Continental Shelf. The comment period, as I've mentioned already, ended in November of 2011. And the release date, we think, we guess, we're not guessing, but we're estimating to be October, a month or so from now. Basically, it has six sections. And there's nothing in this that really um, is particularly surprising. Uh, Stop work authority. Uh, basically, they're saying, that anyone on a facility has the authority to stop work if they think something dangerous is happening. Ultimate work authority is basically who's in charge. Employee participation is now included. Uh, procedures or systems for reporting unsafe working conditions, which basically is a sort of whistleblower uh, concept. The use of independent third party auditors and the JSA job safety analysis extension, which Steve alluded to. The key to me in all of these, with the possible exception of the uh, independent auditors, is it's very people-oriented. And clearly that comes out of Deepwater Horizon. The Deepwater Horizon event was going on for at least two days. If someone had said somewhere at some time, you know what, we're losing control, let's stop what we're doing, take a break and think about it, uh, SEMS2 would never have had to be written. 
Um, independent third party auditors is somewhat controversial. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But basically what the agency is saying in the draft terms two is that all audits need to be conducted by independent third party auditors, usually called I3Ps. In other words, especially the larger companies offshore typically audit themselves and have done historically. And I've been involved in many of those audits. No longer will that apply. They're going to have to hire independents. And that's going to be tough. These independent auditors are going to have to be skilled in process safety, highly knowledgeable about offshore, uh, and to and to be independent of, of the companies they're auditing, which in practice is, is tough because many of them have worked for those companies over their careers. The JSA extension is confusing. Basically, it's a mix of what we will call process hazards analysis and occupational safety. There's nothing particularly difficult about it. SEMS 2 is interesting because it's the first new offshore safety regulation basically anywhere in the world, as far as I know, for quite some years. So it shows the way that regulators are thinking. There's quite a lot of discussion as to whether or not SEMS 2 is prescriptive or non-prescriptive. It's like most regulations, it's actually a mixture. I would say it's actually non-prescriptive, but it's not risk-based. The traditional non-prescriptive standards, the safety case approach, was risk-based. You calculate the risk, you have some threshold of acceptable risk, and if you're over that, you have to do something about it. There's nothing like that in SEMS 2. It's all to do with behavior, things like stop work authority. So what's not there? There's nothing about quantification of risk. Um, there's no discussion at all of acceptable risk, LARP, or anything like that. There is no suggestion of a safety case, and I've talked to the management at BESI, and there's no suggestion from them that they're even thinking of safety cases and the related formal risk assessments. In practice, of course, people are doing formal risk assessments, things like vapor modeling, explosion modeling, um, but they're doing it because they think it's a good idea, not because it's the law. Um, so I would say that it's a balance between prescriptive and non-prescriptive. But the third element in particular makes it non-prescriptive. This is what employee participation it says. Management must consult whether employees on the development and implementation of a company SEMS program. Um, the key word there is consulting. If you start saying employees must consult with management, you're no longer um, into a prescriptive environment. So when you come to audits, the audits are going to be difficult because they're going to be assessing human and, and, and sort of management systems rather than formal risk analysis. So it's going to be difficult to assess how well people are doing. Changing subjects, the rule of contractors. This came out just, I think, about three weeks ago. And of course, everyone a bit by surprise, a lot by surprise. It's an interim policy document. Um, and what they're saying, and this is not just SEMS, it's all of Bess's uh, rules. Um, that they can issue an ink, an incident of non-compliance, to contractors. This is new. The philosophy offshore in the Gulf of Mexico and, other, and the United States has always been that the operator is responsible for um, anything that goes on. If there's an audit and the, the agency has a finding, they're going, to, they're going to audit the operator, not the contractor, even if the contractor was at fault. And then it's up to the operator and contractor to sort it out. Now they're saying they can, they can audit and, and, and cite contractors separately. I'm troubled by this. Firstly, it's interim policy is de facto rulemaking. This is, should certainly go up for public comment to become a formal rule. But they're doing it by a letter, which I don't like and I think is, is questionable. It's going to be very difficult to determine how you split responsibility. Now it's easy. It's always the operator. And they haven't thought through, I don't think, the issue as to whether or not this covers design work. I'm not going to go through this, of course, there's a lot of words, but basically this is what the, let, the letter says. This is the content of the letter. Um, I3P then, uh, independent third party auditors, also controversial. Uh, I mentioned earlier the requirements for an I3P are very hard to meet. You've got to be a process safety expert and an offshore expert, and you have to be independent. And um, frankly, there are not many people meet those qualifications. And uh, I think logistically, it's going to be very tough to implement this, this requirement. And when the SEMS 2 does come out in its final form, I think that's what people will be looking for the most. 
having said which, I don't think it's going to change. Um, everything I've heard from Besser is that nothing's going to be removed from SEMS, the proposed SEMS to things, but they may add things. Uh, finally, I'll wrap up. Uh, a lot of the practical implementation of SEMS is occurring through the Center for Offshore Safety. Steve mentioned the Center for Chemical Process Safety, the CCPS. Um, the Center for Offshore Safety has a rough correspondence to CCPS, but it's part of API. And probably the big difference between them and CCPS is that they're actually involved in activities. The CCPS, as you know, is mostly a sort of information organization. They publish books and they have seminars and they have conferences and magazines and so on. Um, the Center for Offshore Safety is actively um, involved in, in the implementation of SEMS. Charlie Williams, who's the director, uh, gave an interview about three weeks ago as part uh, with the Lloyd's Register company. Uh, I haven't put the full web address there because it's, it's one of those long addresses, but it is available for download. And, and if you want to find out more about it, contact myself or Steve, or just go to the LinkedIn site. I've put the reference there. So that explains his philosophy, and that's about three weeks ago. Um, what they've done is develop, well, actually, they didn't do it. This was done before the center was, was formed. But various committees, of which I was a member, um, created a whole bunch of audit documents. These audit documents will be, uh, can be downloaded for free. You can go and get them. They've been there now for maybe nearly a year, certainly many months. And the idea is that, these, uh, that the Center for Offshore Safety will become the sort of clearinghouse for auditors and auditing companies, that they will authorize and certify these companies to be able to do audits of SEMS. And they will provide accreditation to the service providers who in turn will hire I3Ps. As I said, there are some logistical issues. There are insufficient I3Ps. And the timing uh, is very, very tight. I mean, the first wave of audits has to be done by November of 2013. And the reality is, um, I don't really have time to go into this, but I think it actually takes five years. So there's going to be some very, very tough management issues. Um, that's the end of my presentation, so I'll switch back to Solvay and be glad to take any questions or comments um, as appropriate. Yeah. All right, Ian, thank you very much. And also, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the question issue. Uh, this is a good. We'll be finishing it, wrapping it up in about five or ten minutes. Uh, then we'll have a question answer session for um, a Ian or a questions can be directed to Ian or myself. Uh, they can be posted on your chat window, or you can request that our producer uh, to, to the rpcorporate.com ID uh, unmute you so you can so you can present the information directly. Are, are we good? Sir? Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk about organizing an effective SEMS program, and I'd like to also close with some good news about some resources that might be out there for you. Uh, first of all, the implementation of SEMS is ongoing. I, I put some weasel words in here that they may not be complete for some offshore facilities or contractors. There's a lot of folks working to get things up to speed right now. Uh, the bulk of the elements are common to other loss prevention programs. And so that does provide you with the resource. Having those other programs that are out there, if you've got onshore arms uh, of your business or uh, onshore business units that have addressed a lot of these management systems issues, you can borrow a lot for them. And you, in our previous comparisons, especially those areas that are minimally different, you really don't have to go too far if you're a large company with onshore business units to find ways that address it that are consistent with your company culture. So you can tap into these resources. You can tap into the technology. You may have expertise in-house to really help you out. Obviously, there's engineering consultants and contractors out there that specialize in SEMP, uh, PSM, RMP, and now are getting involved in SEMS. Uh, risk management professionals is one of them. But internally, a lot of large companies already have a lot of these resources. And as Ian mentioned, there can be real scarcity of resources at some point. Uh, so anyhow, some recommended strategies, if you're a little behind in trying to catch up, you've got a broad spectrum of things that are encompassed by that. Uh, it can be daunting. The thing to do is, um, how do you eat an elephant? Take one bite at a time. You've got to go pick these areas and, and move forward. One of the things you want to keep in mind is minimizing duplication. 
Um, you've had similar objectives for all these different safety management systems requirements. Uh, you want to take advantage of that. Uh, and, we're, and in a lot of cases, if you can unify the programmatic elements, even if only some of them can be unified between your onshore and offshore business units, that can be a real plus for main, maintaining it and maintaining a consistent company culture for managing safety. Um, we recommend starting simple. Look, if you've got something that's working that addresses a performance or goal-oriented regulatory requirement like SEMS is, you've already met your goal. If you've met your goal, why, why reinvent the wheel? Take what you've got, incorporate it, then go back, do a gap analysis, an internal audit if you want to. Even though there's independent third-party audits, as Ian mentioned, there's nothing stopping from a company for doing more than that, doing internal audits to gauge the health and implementation of these different programs. And if you do that, if you, if you do a DAP analysis, which a lot of people refer to it as, you'll find those areas that you can improve and focus on those rather than, again, this, this daunting task. Uh, again, uh, as Ian mentioned, there's, a, there's, there's potential scarcity of resources, and you really need to have multiple departments, organizations, uh, even working with the agencies, there has to be a lot of interaction and cooperation. Um, another challenge that offshore facilities has is the number of facilities and logistics. You've got a lot of resources onshore. Um, there's a lot of technology now for uh, networking, uh, interacting electronically. A lot of those things, in, ad in addition to web-based software, and even as I mentioned before, we, um, we use the current mechanism that we're communicating to you with for a lot of uh, long distance has up studies or has up study updates. So there's a lot you can do with current technology to make this a much more manageable task. Uh, also as resources, and I'm gonna give you some of the links that uh, Ian referred to a few minutes ago, but we also have on our website, um, we've been doing a lot of, of, as part of our outreach program, a lot of webinars that are co have covered the full gamut of the key SEMS uh, elements. Uh, we've been doing that since uh, mid-2010, and the webinar is listed on this page, and the next slide uh, are out there. They're recorded. You're welcome to, to view them off our website, and I've got a link to that in my, in my last page. Uh, again, as part of our, our, our ongoing outreach program, uh, we're going to be uh, speaking at the uh, Prevention First Symposium in Long Beach in October, October 23rd and 24th. Um, on, on a rather advanced topic, which correlates the um, uh, high integrity protection systems and how you use risk analysis to integrate that with safety integrity levels, a lot of terms you may not have heard, kind of higher end uh, stuff in terms of looking at, at modern protection systems. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing that at the conference, so we're going to uh, do that as part of a webinar on October 18th, again, as part of our outreach program. Just as a little added benefit for everybody. And, Personally, I'm going to use it as kind of a dry run, too. Uh, so anyhow, uh, there's a, also, if you're interested in attending Prevention First, we provided a link here uh, for one of the coordinating agencies. And then I guess what I'd like to do is tell you what's on this page and then open it up for questions. On this page, obviously, there are ways to contact myself or Ian if you have any questions or you need any support on activities. Uh, there's the phone number I gave you before, our primary website. And also, the link to these different webinar recordings, uh, you're welcome to use them for, as training materials. We actually use our outreach program also to uh, train personnel and familiarize personnel with a lot of these concepts internally. You're welcome to make use of that. That's what it's all about. Uh, also, the LinkedIn uh, reference that Ian mentioned before, the specific wording for uh, that one SEMS site that Ian has posted those links and that information, it's also included here in the second bullet under resources. So let me go ahead and open it up for questions. Again, questions, can, you can, you're welcome to start an interactive discussion. You're welcome to ask to be unmuted to vocalize a question, or you're welcome to post a question on a chat window, and it'll be re-vocalized by our producer. All right. We do have one question here for Steve. With the evolution of SEMS, do you see a closer working relationship between agencies and operating companies? I think, as, as Ian mentioned, one of the one of the concerns 
is uh, with a lot of the things that are coming out with the independent third party audits and a lot of the close supervision that Bessie is, is planning with respect to supervision of the implementation of SIMS and also enforcement, I think a lot of people are concerned about uh, a potentially um, adversarial or overwhelming, um, overwhelming relationship uh, between the, the uh, regulator and, and industry. Um, our observations have been a little different, though. And, and of course, things go up and down, just like any relationship. But um, when you look at process safety management, which when you look at risk management programs, when you look especially at the, uh, the st way state agencies uh, regulate things in California, whether you're looking at offshore facilities through the State Lands Commission, or whether you're looking at onshore facilities that are handled by what they call in California CUPAs. Um, I'm not even going to tell you what that stands for. But when you're looking at that, there's a closer relation. When you look at the need for a um, direct relationship between the regulator for looking at these safety management systems and enforcing them, the regulator gets more up to speed because it's non-prescriptive. They've got to educate themselves more uh, for performance-based regulations. And um, as part of that, they spend a lot more time directly interacting with the with the uh, operating companies rather than just showing up, pointing to something that may be out of place and going like, okay, you're getting cited. So that close working relationship over time, or that interaction over time, helps build a good working relationship. And and so. If you look at how things have occurred in the past, these kind of performance-based regulations and these things have helped build relationships that are workable and they're also sustainable. Uh, and also, if you look at initiatives, uh, we looked at that timeline earlier. Um, uh, you remember the three arrows and, and how offshore United States, offshore United Kingdom, and onshore uh, regulations for safety management systems have evolved. Initiatives were taken both by industry and by the regulatory agencies to try to put together frameworks that are actually functional, that can be, that are fairly balanced. And in terms of the enforcement and implementation, uh, my observation is from the, uh, as I do see, a lot of effort being made to make sure that the regulation and enforcement is balanced. So you see initiatives on both sides of the table, agency and industry, and you also see both, both sides having the framework to better work together through these safety management systems programs. So my hope is that, that it's going to build for stronger relationships and for a better program that benefits both the safety of personnel and also the environment. I get, do we have any other questions, Solvay? We do not have any more questions, Steve. I guess I'm going to ask one of Ian. Um, uh, Ian, for you mentioned some uh, resource problems with the uh, independent third party audits uh, because of the timing and depth of what needs to happen and perhaps the scarcity of, of the number of people out there. How do you see that playing out? I mean, what do you think folks are going to do to, to make it actually work? Um, first, uh, before getting to that, just a quick comment on the first question about the regulatory relationship. Um, compared with onshore, it's much worse um, historically. Um, one thing that may help is that the, the appointment of Director Watson in November of last year as head of BESI, I think will help that relationship. Um, but still, it, I perceive it as being considerably more adversarial than it is onshore. Um, the resource issue, I, I simply don't know. Uh, we, I reiterate, we don't know what the SEMS2 rule will say. Um, I, one possibility, and it's purely my speculation, is that uh, companies, the large oil companies in particular, may have mixed teams. They'll use their own auditors, which they've done for years, uh, but will have on the team at least one I3P as a sort of representing the outside world. Um, uh, alternatively, we're just into a, a very rapid training as, as, as larger auditing companies uh, get, get certified by the Center for Offshore Safety, and then they're going to be hiring people to become auditors who will be certified. And it's just going to be a lot of work to get people certified very quickly. And one has to wonder about the quality of the audits when things are moving so fast. That's my answer. That's, but I, the, the honest answer is we don't know. All right. Fair enough. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so, any other questions? All right. Uh, did, you, did you guys have any other comments you wanted to, make, to offer? <laughs> yeah, Mark. Mark. 
Oh, I, uh, did you want, did you want to be? Uh, you'll need a microphone, so everybody can help. And um, did you want to comment or ask a question? Yeah, I had a question for okay. Ian. Um, Ian, uh, my question had to do with the use of SIL calculations. I was wondering what your thoughts were about that as as helping to fill the void in in uh, adding a little bit of risk based. Um, uh, adding adding to risk based type uh, assessment in the hazards analysis portion of a SEMS type program. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Firstly, um, as far as I can uh, understand it, it's not part of the the regulation. But what I'm seeing, especially the larger companies, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole second issue here, which is regardless of the regulations and rules. Companies are doing things like SIL analysis and, and, risk and formal safety assessments and essentially developing safety cases for economic reasons. When a unit of currency is a billion dollars, which these big platforms are, then, then they're doing uh, formal safety assessments even though they don't have to. I mean, I've participated in many of them. Just last week, I was asked to uh, help with a proposal where a company wants to put in a HIP system so they can use low pressure piping and, and save a lot of money, but it means that they have to have a very, very good SIL analysis. So my perception is that, especially with the larger companies in deep water, the SIL analysis and, and related activities are, are not only being done, but they're being done more and more. Uh, but it's not a regulatory issue, it, it's a voluntary issue. Does that make sense? I'll, okay, I'm, and any more thoughts? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ian. We don't seem to have any more questions. All right, good. Well, in that case, let me thank all participants for attending today. Appreciate the feedback. And uh, again, if you do have any follow-up questions or need support, give us a call. And again, keep tuning in as part of our outreach program. We do want to make it as useful as possible. And if you have any suggestions, I uh, look forward to seeing your comments. Thank you. Okay, excellent.